The stunning scene on the Union Pacific tracks heading to downtown LA, where officials say thieves are breaking into railroad containers and emptying goods onto the tracks. Boxes meant for customers littering the rail lines after being pulled from moving freight trains. Thieves then swooping in to grab the most valuable items. Police say they're now increasing patrols. As the pandemic rages this winter, hospitalizations are now at a record high across the U.S., some systems at the breaking point. And tonight, we take you to the front lines with the healthcare workers facing the Omicron surge hitting America's children. Pediatric hospitalizations quadrupling in the last month and taking a toll on parents. When you look at her right now, what are you thinking? Um, I want it to get better. I want to be able to take my baby home. And I'll... I wish she didn't have this. I really do wish she didn't have this. Stuart Rhodes, the founder of the Oath Keepers, appearing in federal court in Texas today, charged with seditious conspiracy for his alleged involvement in the January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol. 11 members of the extremist group are now facing charges. ABC's Pierre Thomas has the latest on what prosecutors revealed today. The alarming report from Ukraine's border with Russia as U.S. intelligence and the White House warn that Russia is preparing an operation to justify invading Ukraine. A so-called false flag operation involving operatives trained in urban warfare. Martha Raditz is here with the details. We're tracking the major winter storm bearing down across the country this weekend. More than 30 states under winter weather alerts from Missouri to Georgia to the East Coast. Heavy snow and ice and bone chilling air expected in the Northeast as temperatures plummet overnight. We'll have the weekend forecast. Evacuate now. The harrowing new look tonight at body camera video from the devastating Colorado wildfire last month. Residents given just moments to leave before the flames came closing in. This is my apartment. And big dreams, small apartment. This TikToker chronicling his big move to the Big Apple to pursue his acting dream. Two million now following his journey on TikTok and rallying around him after a recent rejection. And he's doing it all from what's been dubbed the tiniest apartment in New York City. I just know that there's other things in store for me now, and I'm even more excited for that. You don't want to miss that interview. Good evening. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. It's a busy Friday night. We are tracking a monster winter storm set to slam large portions of the country and an unprecedented admission by the Pentagon about Russia. But first, we begin with the pandemic. There are many headlines tonight. The CDC formally issued guidelines that discourage Americans from wearing cloth masks, saying they offer the least protection and surgical masks masks, KN95s and N95s offer more. And beginning tomorrow, you will be able to order up to eight at-home COVID tests a month paid for by insurance. And starting on Wednesday, Americans can visit this site, covidtests.com, and order up to four free rapid tests per home. All of this to address the concerning Omicron surge, which has so many hospitals at a breaking point. Overall, hospitalizations now at a record high. And children, especially entering hospitals in numbers not seen before this pandemic. And that is where we begin. Kana Whitworth is inside an overwhelmed pediatric ICU, where doctors and parents have a plea tonight. Get your child vaccinated if you can. This. Just take a little life around. Jackie Eadley is in the hospital holding her baby girl, Anisha. She's sick with COVID. Um, she was diagnosed with COVID on Wednesday. Um, she has really high fevers. Um, she has trouble breathing and she will not eat her food. She's not alone. An increasing number of parents are confronting the harsh reality of the toll COVID-19 is taking on America's children. 580,000 positive pediatric cases in just the past week. Doctors at Dayton Children's Hospital giving her baby an IV, trying to get fluids into the severely underweight infant. That's crazy because she's um, a preemie, so it's like, is her body going to be able to fight this, you know? That's, that's the first thing I'm thinking, like, is she going to be able to fight this? She's so small. Jackie has three other kids, all boys, all at home, worried about their little sister. Um, my two oldest, they're, well, they're all vaccinated for one, but stuff my two-year-old, so they didn't get really many symptoms. But my two-year-old, he, he had fevers for a while, but they went away. To date, Dayton Children's Hospital has only treated one vaccinated patient. 
They say that particular child had severe comorbidities. Nationwide, just 35% of children 5 to 17 are vaccinated. There's no approved vaccine for children under five. Almost all of the kids admitted for COVID have been unvaccinated. Doctors say two thirds of them also have underlying health issues and are experiencing respiratory distress. But you can even see it in the faces of kids who can't even talk yet. You know, their eyes get really big and they, you know, just we watch them struggle to breathe. 10 to 20% of these kids end up in the ICU. They currently have one child on a ventilator. Throughout the pandemic, you have never had this many COVID patients in your pediatric ICU. Yeah, this is more than what we were getting before, yes. By extreme numbers? Uh, yes, extreme numbers, yes. Dr. Vipul Patel, the chief of pediatric intensive care, says he's working harder than ever. So ICU is very busy. Uh, we have so many COVID patients coming in and out of the unit, and they're all critical. They're all critical? Yes, they're very critical. My concerning thing is that if they come early, we can save them. If they come late, it's very difficult to save them. The chief medical officer at Dayton Children's, Adam Mezoff, is a father to three and a grandfather to five. He's been doing this 40 years. I have seen the illnesses that we now routinely vaccinate children for before they get to school, and I've seen the devastation those illnesses can cause. COVID-19 related hospitalizations among children are hitting pandemic highs nationwide, quadrupling in the last month. Federal data showing that 880 COVID-19 positive children are being admitted to the hospital every day. Doctors in Dayton say at any given time since the end of December, around 20 kids are hospitalized at a time for COVID. Ohio currently has 300 children in the hospital. A toll on parents that is hard to imagine. Yes, I am very scared. I am terribly scared, terribly scared. When you look at her right now, what are you thinking? Um, I want it to get better. I want to be able to take my baby home. And I, I wish she didn't have this. I really do wish she didn't have this. She says she has seen some improvement, but she still has a fever and trouble eating. What do you want to say to parents out there that think um, that Omicron does not impact kids? I'm letting you know it's true, it's real. Um, don't listen to what people say that it's not. Our thanks to Kena. Now to the massive winter storm moving across the country tonight. Some places facing the prospect of the first snowfall in years. From the Midwest to the Southeast to the Northeast, heavy snow and treacherous ice. And first, the bitter Arctic blast ahead of it. Our Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us tonight. Good evening, Rob. Hi, Stephanie. Boy, the temperatures are plunging across the northeast as this uh, storm just off the coast is really starting to intensify and pull down some cold air. It's all in it advance of this next system that's already brought a lot of snow to the northern plains. I'll show you where it is now. It's uh, going to bring anywhere from five to ten inches of snow from Omaha up through uh, Cedar Rapids and then uh, crossing through parts of Minneapolis. But then it dives down to the south and east where there's cold enough air in place in places like Atlanta and Gainesville and Columbia and Charlotte to where we'll see a, a mix if not some serious icing. There's been ice storm warnings that now have been posted for parts of the Carolinas and look at the snow all the way back in the parts of Mississippi and Tennessee will be accumulating. This thing rides the Appalachians. That inland track will then bring in milder air on the east side of it. And that means the coastal areas in the I-95 corridor will see snow change over to rain. And we probably won't see much in the way of accumulation in these bigger cities. But inland, uh, 5 to 10 inches certainly will be widespread, maybe over a foot in some spots. In that pink area, that's the dangerous spot that where icing conditions are going to be uh, certainly a problem. And then these wind chills, uh, temperatures plummeting across the northeast as that's the low that's heading towards the Canadian Maritimes explodes and really pulls down this cold air and blows it pretty good. And I feel like 2 in New York. Minus 7 here in Hartford, Connecticut, minus 21 in Binghamton and Syracuse in the morning. So dangerous wind chills to start things off this weekend, Stephanie. Dangerous indeed. And Rob, can you talk more specifically about the ice threat in the southeast? We saw that highlighted there on the map. It's a region traditionally not as well prepared for the ice and, and possible snow, right? Yeah, it, it, traditionally, yeah, they always get one, maybe two snow and ice storms a year. This one does look like a bad setup uh, for South Carolina, 
along the I-85 corridor, maybe even southeast of I-84. There you see the warning that just popped up between Charlotte and Columbia, and you even get it stretching into one county in eastern uh, Georgia. We get this cold air that can dam up across the mountains there, and then, and then just enough mild air noses in to where freezing rain and, rain and sleet can accumulate. And, um, you know, that wide an area... You know, we're going to see we're going to see some power outages uh, because of that. So I, I, aside from the driving situation, which is obviously treacherous at the least, uh, when you get enough ice on, on the power lines and the tree limbs in excess of, a, say, a quarter of an inch, uh, you can see those things come down. And it's not ha it's not fun to be without power in the dead of winter with temperatures that will be below freezing, Stephanie. So uh, folks in, in that area do need to be prepared. Absolutely. Folks will need to be very careful this weekend. Thank you so much for that, Rob. We'll be watching you all weekend long on Good Morning America and World News. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Jeff. We turn now to the most serious charges yet in the January 6th Capitol riot. As 11 members of the right-wing militia group, the Oath Keepers, are facing indictment for seditious conspiracy. Today, the group's leader, Stuart Rhodes, appeared in court in Texas, where he stands accused of planning the use of force to block the 2020 election's certification. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Today, Stuart Rhodes, the founder and head of the right-wing militia group, the Oath Keepers, facing a federal judge, and if convicted, potentially decades in prison. He intends to fight these charges till the very, very end. The hearing a day after the FBI searched his home north of Dallas, where Rhodes, a Yale Law School graduate and Army veteran, was taken into custody. Rhodes and at least 10 other alleged members of the Oath Keepers accused of seditious conspiracy of a premeditated plot to use force to block the certification of Joe Biden's election as president. And according to the FBI, Rhodes allegedly began planning to disrupt the transfer of power soon after the November 2020 election. This is what he said just days after the election. Because we have men already stationed outside D.C. as a nuclear option in case they attempt to remove the president illegally. We will step in and stop it. That planning allegedly included reconnaissance of the nation's capital, buying firearms, ammunition, gun scopes, and other tactical gear. He allegedly bought tens of thousands of dollars of worth of ammunition and weapons in the days before and after January 6th. And plans were allegedly made for teams of heavily armed quick reaction forces to stand by right outside the nation's capital. Prosecutors say these images show Oath Keepers staging weapons in a Virginia hotel. The indictment details a series of chilling encrypted communications, allegedly between Rhodes and his followers. On December 11th, 2020, Rhodes allegedly sent a message in a private group chat stating that if President-elect Biden were to assume the presidency, quote, it will be a bloody and desperate fight. We're going to have a fight. That can't be avoided. And on Christmas Day, Rhodes allegedly wrote of Congress, it will be torches and pitchforks time if they don't do the right thing. Another Rhodes attorney who says his client never went inside the Capitol claims the government's case is built on lies. They went to the Capitol to provide security at a demonstration that turned into chaos. And Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, this was an initial appearance. So what happens next? So Rhodes will stay in custody until a January 20 detention hearing where prosecutors are likely to argue that he's a threat and should not be released, Stephanie. All right, Pierre Thomas Forrest there in Washington. Thanks so much. Now to the major accusation from the U.S. against Moscow today, saying that Russia is posi positioning operatives in eastern Ukraine for what's called a false flag operation. Here's what that means. They're saying they may create an incident in order to justify a possible invasion. ABC's chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raditz has those details. Tonight, independent sources inside Russia providing unverified images of more heavy Russian military equipment rolling west on rail card. As we get a troubling new sign, an invasion could be just weeks away, according to a U.S. official. In addition to the 100,000 Russian troops massed on Ukraine's border, the Biden administration today accusing Russia of pre-positioning operatives in eastern Ukraine who are trained in urban warfare and explosives to create a possible provocation that Vladimir Putin would use to justify an invasion. An operation designed to look like an attack on them or their people 
or Russian speaking people uh, in Ukraine, um, again, as an excuse to, to go in. The White House saying that Russian influence actors have also been fabricating provocations on social media. When there isn't an actual crisis to suit their needs, they'll make one up. And so we're watching for that. The accusations come after a week of talks with Russia that did nothing to de-escalate the situation. The Russian foreign minister today still insisting that Russia wants a guarantee that Ukraine will not join NATO, a guarantee the U.S. will not provide, with Putin threatening a military technical response if conditions are not met, a threat which he has not explained. But today... Hackers penetrated and crippled dozens of Ukrainian government websites, leaving ominous messages, be afraid and expect the worst. And Martha, the timing of those cyber attacks concerning many and this warning on the possible false flag operation is an extraordinary move by the U.S. So why would the U.S. reveal Russia's alleged plans? Well, I, I think one of the reasons is they hope it stops any planning by the Russians. And, of course, the Russians say they have no plans to invade, but the U.S. is certainly not convinced of that. And they say, a U.S. official says, if Russia does make the decision to invade, it could be any time starting now, mid-January to mid-February. So this is something the U.S. is very, very concerned about and watching every single minute, Stephanie. And Martha, one more question. How is Russia responding to the U.S. tonight? Uh, basically, they say none of what the U.S. says is true. They have no plans to do anything like that. And they just continue to push back against the U.S., saying these talks obviously have gone nowhere so far. Stephanie? All right, Martha, thank you so much for that report. Now to what you may have noticed in your local supermarket empty shelves. Shortages now hitting stores coast to coast. Our Victor Okendo is tracking what's happening and when relief may be in sight. Tonight, the new round of grocery shortages, sending some stores across the country scrambling to restock shelves. The shelves are pretty bare. There's no meat, no toilet paper. It's just crazy. Experts blaming issues, including Omicron-related staffing shortages for stores and suppliers, supply chain backlogs due to the pandemic, more people eating at home, and soaring freight costs from a lack of truckers and recent extreme weather. All of these factors happening all at once is a perfect storm. Shortages and headaches for the consumer that's going out there. I went in there to get like mayonnaise, and I've been actually trying to get one jar for the past month, and it hasn't been there. Every time I come, it's never there. The Consumer Brands Association finding American grocery stores typically have 7 to 10 percent of their items out of stock at any given time. Right now, that number is at about 15 percent for food and beverage products. Smaller may be better when it comes to getting the product that you need. The smaller grocery stores are very nimble. They get more deliveries at a more frequent rate. And Aldi, a major supermarket chain, apologized to customers this week because several items were not in stock. The company is blaming shipping delays, saying that they are working around the clock to fix it. Stephanie? All right, Victor, thanks so much for that report. Next to the dramatic new body camera video of the harrowing moments as the Marshall Fire in Colorado closed in on entire communities. Residents with just moments to pack up everything they owned. You'll want to see this. Will Carr reports. Go towards Denver! Evacuate now! Tonight, new heart-pounding body camera video showing the dramatic and dangerous escape from that deadly Colorado wildfire. Move now! Leave your stuff! Go! Everybody head east! Get out of the store now! First responders racing into this Costco, Everybody telling shoppers to leave now. immediately. To evacuate now! Leave whatever you're doing! Go! Rescuers driving through thick smoke as flames devoured neighborhoods. <laughs> Sheriff's office! Sheriff's office! Going door to door, urging families to get out. Ma'am, you have to evacuate. Yeah, we are. We're back. We're okay. Back. We're leaving let's right load now. up and let's go, All okay? Right. These officers okay. racing to help horses get to safety. Smoke blanketing the sky, this officer rescuing a pair of dogs found running in the street. The December fire destroying more than a thousand homes and businesses near Boulder, killing at least one person, a second person still missing. 
just incredible to see how quickly that fire was moving. Our thanks to Will for that report. When we come back, what Alec Baldwin did in the investigation into the deadly rust set shooting and the growing anger at a judge's decision to reverse a rape conviction. We hear from the survivor. But up next, Latin X. So many use the word, but why most of the people who it's describing don't like the term. We'll talk about it. That's coming up. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Your... This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. What is in a name? Well, a lot. And when it comes to the Hispanic, Latino, Latinx community, knowing what name applies is a point of confusion and even contention. Recently, the oldest Latino civil rights organization in the U.S. said they would no longer be using the term Latinx, and so did a top Latino congressman. But people and groups who support the term say it makes the community more inclusive. So what are 60 million people in the U.S. supposed to call themselves? That is the question we're hoping language researcher, author, and let's not forget TikTok sensation, Dr. Jose Medina can help answer for us. Dr. Medina, thank you so much for being here. Let's jump right in. Where did the term Latinx originate from and who created it? Absolutely. So there is no definite um, beginning to the term Latinx here in the United States. Some people feel like um, it started to appear in academia, specifically Latinx writers. Um, around 2004. But the truth is that there are others that point to scholars and researchers in Puerto Rico, in Central America, South America, and other parts of the Caribbean that were actually using the X and also the at sign to be more inclusive in their studies and in their work, their writing work. 
In your opinion, do you think they were trying to modernize the terms like Hispanic and Latino? Look, as an openly queer, Latinx, Latine, Spanglish-speaking, language researcher of the world, to me, that intersectionality is really, really important. Sometimes I identify as Chicano and Pocho. Sometimes I identify as Mexican-American. But I also, specifically in queer communities, identify as a member of the Latinx community. And the reason why that's so important is that no one really gets to choose how somebody self-identifies. And, and doctor, this controversy is so interesting because the term is so multi-layered. It doesn't just define its members in the U.S., but also across all of Latin America. That's nearly two dozen countries. It's it's an intersection of language, multiculturalism, gender identity, and feminism. Is it possible to even find a common ground? Look, I, I don't think that we need to. I think that any time that we are trying to police language and that are specifically seeking a way to tell folks how they need to view themselves, we continue cycles of oppression. Now, there are a lot of folks that actually are saying that the Latinx term should not be used because it cannot be conjugated in Espanol. But the truth is, is that if we really stop to think about it, we were colonized from the moment that the Spaniards came to the Americas and took away indigenous tongues. And so all of these attacks on really utilizing and leveraging linguistic liberation as a way to value intersectionality is something that each and every one of us should defend, not oppose. Right, and that begs the question, why create this umbrella? Right, everyone, like you said, you can identify as Chicano or Dominican and Puerto Rican and that's it, right? But you touch on a really important point. The community here in the U.S. is very bilingual and grammatically speaking, some argue that term is U.S.-centric, Latinx, and doesn't translate into Spanish, but, uh, and it doesn't fit in with the Spanish language and its rules. How can it work with words like amigos or, or friends? So this is not just something that is utilized in the United States. I think that a lot of folks with racial privilege have tried to politicize the term Latin X, when in reality, somebody with racial privilege should not be telling me or any other queer Latinx, Latine, Chicano, Mexicano, Pocho individual, how we get to identify those intersections that make us beautiful as participants in this democracy in the United States. I want you to look at this graphic of a Gallup poll. While only 4% say they identify as Latinx, a point Gallup made, which I found interesting, is that 57% of those polled say it doesn't matter what they're called. Why do you think such a big chunk of the community is indifferent about what they're called? Absolutely. Look, Stephanie, the truth is, is that many of us, specifically Black, Indigenous communities of color, have been uh, marginalized for so long, including from the moment that we entered into the schooling building, that we've been conditioned to try to fit into this mold. I mean, even what we say, you know, um, the United States is a melting pot. It's something that we usually see as, as something of pride. The truth is that all that we are saying when we say that we are a melting pot is that somehow we need to amalgamate into this one thing. And what do you think will happen within the next couple of years uh, when it comes to this term? Do you think it's something that's going to go away? Definitely, if you go deeper into those polls that you're referencing, it seems to be folks that are a little bit older that are not familiar or that perhaps are not interested in really valuing that intersectionality that younger folks are wanting to value. And before I let you go, I'd love for you to hit on a big picture point for us with this infighting over what we call ourselves. How much harder does it make it to really fight for causes that propel the entire community forward? It's difficult, Stephanie. I mean, at the end of the day, all of us are a hot mess. I mean, I don't know if somebody's told you today, Stephanie, but you're a hot mess. And <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not mess. to be, I'm okay? I'm, I'm trying to keep it together, okay? <laughs> I know, but all of us, all of us bring bias and prejudice into mm. any space. And when we say, no, I don't have a prejudice bone in my body, the truth is, first of all, mentirosa, mentiroso, <laughs> mentirose, liar, liar, pants on fire. But second of all, we need to work on being more inclusive. And at the end of the day, that's all that the Latinx term is really about. It's about creating a safe space. Creating a safe space for absolutely everyone. Completely agree. Por favor. Claro, claro que comadre. Sí. That is exactly it. <laughs> comadre. Got that in there too. I appreciate it. I'm <laughs>
Dr. Medina, thank you so much for your honesty and your insight. And of course, your time. Always a pleasure to have you on ABC News Live. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Adios y saludes a todos. <laughs> Still ahead here on Prime, the young man who went viral for living in a very small apartment. It's this week's TikTok. And is the price of chocolate about to go up? We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day from actor John Stamos speaking about the burial of his very close friend, Bob Saget. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. <laughs> Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was gonna say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. being live is Three all seconds. about Rise, this is abc news live all right we're gonna move back let's move back we're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter run urgent delivery run with not afraid to go there so my question mr president what are you so afraid of breaking news live events this is the moment Lift off. streaming straight to you anytime anywhere you just met one friend right here you're watching abc news live thanks for streaming with us Welcome back. Is the price of chocolate about to go way up? Well, with many hunkered down during the pandemic and this really cold weather, chocolate is getting more popular. But the production of cocoa, chocolate's main ingredient, might not keep up with demand. Here's a look by the numbers. Chocolate sales have been climbing more than 5% a quarter. That's according to Bloomberg. And we haven't gotten to Valentine's Day yet. So at the same time, cocoa production appears to be slowing down. Two thirds, 66% percent of the world's cocoa comes from the Ivory Coast and Ghana. Ivory Coast officials say their country's crop is expected to drop by 10 percent this season compared to the same time last year. And in Ghana, cocoa deliveries have dropped 45 percent year over year. That's according to the International Cocoa Organization. High demand and low supply usually means price hikes. The cocoa futures market hit a two-month high this week, and there are signs that cocoa and chocolate prices will keep rising. And finally, with reduced cocoa production in West Africa, chocolate makers have been tapping into domestic reserves. Certified stockpiles at U.S. ports have fallen 20% since last year, and that's according to Bloomberg. 
And we still have a lot to get to here on Crime. Tennis star Novak Djokovic facing deportation again. We have those details. And the big change to French dressing. And the story of true perseverance, the man who sold his shoe collection to afford IVF, and the couple's relentless optimism. But first, here's a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The CDC warning that loosely woven cloth masks provide the least protection, that N95 and KN95 masks might be a better option. We have never had this many COVID patients in the hospital at any point in the pandemic. The governor of Wisconsin calling in the National Guard to help with nurse staffing shortages as patients stream in. We've all seen the tragic story of individuals who need urgent care and treatment, whether COVID or not, but can't get it because our hospitals are full. Some waiting hours to get tested for the virus. Officials in Utah changing their guidelines, urging symptomatic people to just stay home for five days instead of getting tested. But health experts say the surge could be peaking or nearing a peak in some states. New information on the investigation into the deadly movie set shooting involving Alec Baldwin. The Santa Fe District Attorney's Office now says it has Alec Baldwin's cell phone. New Mexico authorities got a search warrant for the phone nearly a month ago. In an Instagram post this week, Baldwin said he delayed handing the phone over due to concerns on whether his private communications would be protected. Baldwin was holding a gun that discharged in October, killing cinematographer Haley Hutchinson, wounding the director, Joel Souza. 
Number one ranked tennis star Novak Djokovic faces deportation again after the Australian government revoked his visa for a second time. This all started back on January 5th when the unvaccinated Djokovic arrived in Australia on an exemption permission to play in the Australian Open. But he was detained at the airport after his visa was canceled. He then spent seven days at a quarantine facility with supporters clashing with police outside on the streets below. It looked like he was back in the tournament after he later won an appeal, but soon after, officials learned Djokovic had COVID and still attended two public events in Serbia last month without wearing a mask. Djokovic's attorneys are already working on an appeal with the hopes that it can be heard on Sunday, allowing him to then have his visa returned in time for him to play Monday when the top half of the draw is set to compete. One of Djokovic's counterparts in the Australian Open, Andy Murray, says the entire ordeal is not good for anyone. Ultimately, people, you know, have to make their own choices, um, but there is also consequences uh, sometimes for, for those decisions um, as well. FedEx wants to put anti-missile lasers on its planes. Why? In its request to the FAA, the company felt the feature could be useful when flying over potentially dangerous contested regions. The defense system is designed to divert missiles fired from the ground. But before even considering approval, the FAA wants to make sure the system works without damaging the plane or other planes in the area. The FDA has ended rules about French salad dressing. Until now, to get the label, dressing makers needed to make it with 35% vegetable oil and vinegar, lemon juice, or lime juice. Now they can use any ingredients they want as long as they're safe. One of the most insidious earworms in the history of the composition of music, now crowned as an all-time favorite by YouTube. Brace yourself. If you can believe it, Baby Shark is now the most watched YouTube video of all time, surpassing 10 billion views. But maybe not so hard to believe if you happen to be a parent of young children. The milestone was reached in just five years. Tonight, the survivor of a rape is speaking out after an Illinois judge overturned the conviction of her rapist, sparking outrage. ABC's Alex Perez spoke with her. An Illinois judge is under fire for reversing his own conviction of a man who was found guilty of sexually assaulting 16-year-old Cameron Vaughn. The judge made me feel like I fought for nothing. Vaughn says she was drunk when 18-year-old Drew Clinton allegedly raped her at a graduation party in Quincy, Illinois last May. Her dad by her side when they learned the conviction was reversed. It felt like Cameron was making strides to get, to get past it. And now it's like the scab's been reopened and she's, you know, has to go through this all again. Um, it's been very, very heartbreaking. According to court transcripts, Judge Adrian, in reversing the decision, blamed parents for, quote, having parties for teenagers where they allow co-eds and female people to swim in their underwear and said the 148 days Clinton had spent in jail already is plenty of punishment. I thought it was outrageous. He, sh like, he blamed every single person except for Drew. He blamed my parents. He made blamed my friends, he blamed myself. He made it seem like it was every other person's fault besides the only person who's in fault. Judge Robert Adrian presided over a bench trial and found Clinton guilty on one count of criminal sexual assault. But during sentencing last week, the same judge granted a defense motion and changed his decision to not guilty and allowed Clinton, who faced four years behind bars, to be released. Judges have enormous discretion. I've never heard before of a judge without additional new evidence, new facts, new information, overturning his own decision. Clinton's defense maintains the encounter with Vaughn was consensual. But the fact of the matter is he was found not guilty, so five months is five months too much because an innocent person should never go to jail. Vaughn now attends classes online as she's dropped out of sports and says she is still emotionally struggling from the alleged assault. What's the message you want to make sure it comes across after what happened in court? I just want every single girl, honestly, everywhere to know that it is okay to stand up for what, you, what happened to you and to not hide it. Our thanks to Alex for that report. Up next, the new warning about air tags. ABC's Becky Worley. 
has the latest. Increasing concern about Apple's AirTags. Law enforcement officials in New Jersey issuing a warning to officers saying AirTags and similar devices pose an inherent threat to law enforcement as criminals could use them to identify officers' sensitive locations, patterns of life, etc. The issue not limited to police. I was seeing videos all over TikTok and everywhere else of people getting notifications on their phone that an air tag has been following them and that people are like placing them on their cars and stuff. Adriana Ballesteros was out shopping with a friend when one of their phones showed this air tag notification. It reads, this item has been moving with you for a while. The owner can see its location. There was a map that showed it followed our exact location from Target all the way back to her house. These two women are not alone. I was at a bar in Tribeca, had my coat on the chair behind me, and once I was already on my walk home, halfway home, I got the notification that was like, someone's tracking you and has been for a while. Sports Illustrated swimsuit model Brooks Nader says she was tracked through New York City, suspecting the tag was placed in her coat when she wasn't looking. It was the scariest, scariest moment ever. The AirTag by Apple is meant to be attached to things frequently lost, like keys or wallets. And then a person can track their AirTag's location with other devices, including cell phones. Their precision and their location tracking is also very, very accurate. So if you're being tracked for nefarious purposes, or if your car is being tracked to be stolen later, that is very concerning, but unfortunately very accurate. For Android phone users, Apple has also released an Android-based app called Tracker Detect, designed to allow Android users an option to track these tags. Apple tells ABC News, we take customer safety very seriously, adding, if users ever feel their safety is at risk, they're encouraged to contact local law enforcement who can work with Apple to provide any available information about the unknown AirTag. Thanks so much for that, Becky. Now turning to a story of true perseverance. For months, ABC News has been following Lauren and EJ Wynn, a couple whose journey to have a baby went viral after EJ sold his shoe collection to pay for fertility treatments. ABC's Alex Prochet brings us their story of relentless hope. <laughs> Lauren and EJ Wynn have always prayed for a child, but the road to parenthood has not been easy. It's everything we have wanted for before we even got married. The journey has been, you know, a little rough for us. Rough and painful. They've tried for more than half a decade, so a facing eight miscarriages and two failed intrauterine inseminations, a medical procedure where sperm is placed directly into the uterus. When we had our first loss, I felt very alone. There's been times where I've just sat there and cried. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do another injection. I can't put us through another loss. Like, I, I just can't. And then you blame yourself because you're like, okay, what's wrong with my body? They started looking into in vitro fertilization, or IVF, to help them get pregnant. This is a series of procedures that requires mature eggs to be removed and fertilized by sperm. The embryo is then transferred back into the womb. So here is our perfect embryo. It's a treatment with a hefty price tag. One cycle of IVF can cost an average of twelve to seventeen thousand dollars. In many cases, the process isn't fully covered by insurance. A lot of people think, "Hey, let's do IVF. We're going to bring home a baby." Doesn't it doesn't even guarantee you an embryo? So that mentally is very, very hard. EJ got creative and helped fund their IVF selling sneakers, dozens from his highly prized collection. The sneaker community was like, man, you sold your whole collection. Having a child was way more important than any shoe. That meant the world to Lauren. It also got the attention of the sneaker community online and others who empathized. Donations poured in, more than $12,000 on GoFundMe. But the winds also broke the ice on a taboo topic. You realize like how many people in the sneaker community were going through it also. I didn't even realize how many guys online would call me and ask me for advice. And then finally this fall, something to cheer for. It's positive. I am pregnant. I'm just praying that this is the one. We were there when Lauren told EJ. Oh, wow. We're pregnant, honey. Oh, good. Oh, we're, man. We're pregnant. <laughs> Congratulations, oh, thank man. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you guys you, for letting us you. be a part of this moment. No, thank yeah. you all. Next, the calls to the family. Oh, um, she's pregnant. You be messing with my emotions. <laughs> <laughs> They've gotten these phone calls before. The prayer is that this time things go differently. You lose that, that joy. You hear miscarriages, but you don't think, oh, it'll happen to me. And then when it does, and then you get pregnant again. 
and it happens again and again and again. You're, you're happy to find a positive test. <laughs> but you're heartbroken at the same time because you don't know what will happen. But Lauren and EJ are staying the course, praying for their miracle baby. I've had over 600 injections, 11 surgeries. I've taken over 1,400 pills. Just since I was pregnant this last this pregnancy, I've had my blood drawn over 60 times. So it's been a lot. And then every week I'd go in for an IVIG infusion. And it's either about a four hour infusion or close to about a seven, seven and a half hour infusion that we do every week. And we'll continue doing that until I deliver the baby. In the past, their miscarriages usually come around the six week mark. But this time, the first heartbeat. There's a yolk sack. From ultrasounds to her growing baby bump, each moment feels like a milestone. <laughs> Lauren and EJ's gender reveal. They're expecting a baby boy. To finally get where we're, you know, where we're at now, it's been amazing. Yes, it's, it's been a miracle. They still have months to go, but the winds have faith. Really, they always have. I have a bump. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, you know, know. <laughs> it, it's crazy. <laughs> Now that hope's being passed along. EJ and Lauren's openness has inspired so many couples facing the same struggle, their perseverance charting a path for other families' journeys. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. A big thank you to the Wins for sharing their story, and we wish them and their growing family all the best. And thanks to Alex for bringing us that report. We now turn to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we interview some of our favorite TikTokers, taking a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Well, our guest this week has made a name for himself with his big dreams and small apartment, chronicling his move from coming Georgia to New York City to pursue acting with his two million TikTok followers. Axel Weber, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank and you're you in your having... apartment, aren't you? I'm right here. This is the whole space. You pretty much get with one shot the entire view. So very nice. Well, you have certainly had an eventful week after sharing with your followers your unfortunate rejection from a performing arts school that shall remain nameless. The internet has rallied around you with celebrities like Charlie Puth sharing their own experiences with rejection. Let's take a listen. I didn't get into five of okay. these prestigious schools that uh, I wanted to get into that I thought Don't could better it. my career. Don't believe it. And while I do think school is great, Same. and I did end up going to Berkeley, okay. a prestigious Berkeley. conservatory for the arts Congrats. is not going to be the thing that defines your career as an actor. Ooh. All right, Axel, so break it down for us. What has this past week been like for you? It's been a bit of a whirlwind, and I didn't expect the response, but it's been an overwhelming amount of support, and I find myself feeling extremely grateful. First of all, for having the opportunity to even audition for Juilliard, and second of all, being able to post it and then receiving things and encouraging thoughts from everyone, um, especially things like from Charlie Puth, who mentioned that he got rejected from schools that he really wanted to go to, and he told me that you don't need it. You don't need a, a prestigious degree to pursue the career that you want. You just need consistency and persistence. And that to me has been a lesson in what you want is there as long as you're willing to work for it. That is certainly some good advice. And the cat's out of the bag. We all know now where you were trying to go. It's all good. For our viewers who may not know, in one of your videos, you say that the reason you botched your audition is because you did a British accent. So you said you can't do accents. So I have to ask what made you audition with a British accent? <laughs> um, I think it's probably because I was watching Peaky Blinders the night before, and I don't know if it's so much British as it is Birmingham, you know, with Thomas Shelby's like, we're the Peaky Blinders. And uh, I guess that was swimming around in my head. And I know that was certainly not the only reason that I didn't get accepted to the school. I could have prepped more. I could have been more prepared. There's a lot of things I could have done. And the school on their part, they just have to make a decision whether or not they want to admit someone to their class. Um, it, it does hurt a little bit knowing that I could have studied at a school that held the likes of uh, Adam Driver and Viola Davis, but I just know that there's other things in store for me now, and I'm even more excited for that. And you just did that British accent there. It's not too bad. 
It's not shabby at all. So break <laughs> down for much. us. Yeah, break down for us the the audition. Like, did you have to submit a monologue? What did you have to do exactly? Aside from adding that British accent, what did you have to do exactly for uh, Juilliard to take a look at you? Deleting the accent actually might have been helpful, but in order to prepare for the audition, I had to do two pieces. One was Shakespeare. One was contemporary. Uh, it's a little convoluted the Shakespeare is a lot of big words like beguile you know had to try and figure out what exactly that means so it was just prepping two pieces and then getting on a zoom call I thought it was going to be in person it was over zoom so I had to sit down when I did it but uh I was just grateful for the opportunity to audition the fact that there's tons of people all around the world who want to pursue a career in the arts and they don't get the chance um so I was grateful to audition I didn't get accepted but now I'm ready to move on to things that I know are going to be bigger and better You've captured the hearts of the internet with your new apartment as well. We've, we could see a little bit of it there in your shot, uh, showing you, you showed in all these videos that it's possible uh, within what's called the tiniest apartment to live in New York City. So I'm curious, how did you find the apartment? I found the apartment on Facebook Marketplace. It was great for me. I could just literally select a location with a big circle and it'd show me where I wanted to be. Uh, before this, I was living in a car, so this is a massive upgrade. I mean, I couldn't even extend my legs to sleep in the back seat of my Volvo. Now I've got a queen bed, I've got a twin mattress, I can change beds if I want. This apartment is perfect for me. A little small, a little cozy, but I can reach everything. I can grab a drink out of my fridge at night and then I can hop right back in bed. It makes me smile just thinking about it. So this is an upgrade. I can only imagine what's next. Exactly. You have a roof over your head, and that is what matters. What is your absolute favorite thing about your cozy apartment? Well, actually, one of my favorite things, other than the fact that I can keep my ham cold, because I used to put it in the backseat of my car and it'd just get warm in the morning, and I'd be eating warm, slimy ham, I'd say the best thing I have here are these Christmas lights. My mother sent me a pack, and I've kind of thrown them all around the place, and it offers a nice, warm, homey feel, because Christmas feels like home. That's awesome. You're making it work, and that is what matters. Well, Axel, thank you so much for your time. We wish you all the best in your career. You've got a long road ahead, but you, you can do this. Thank Persistence you. is key. Trust me. Thank you. <laughs> and before we go tonight, the image of the day posted on Twitter by the San Diego Zoo. They warn it may cause a fear of birds. There it is. You get an up close and personal look. Hope the camera and photographer are okay, but quite the angle. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. next hour, the new recommendation about masks. We have the details. And our conversation with one of the stars of the new Disney Plus hit, Boba Fett. Stay with us. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is Free all Jackie, about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. She set the standard for what we call now the mothers of the movement. I can't remember a day that I have been free from the memory of Emmett's death. I will take that hurt to my grave. The fight in Mrs. Mobley, the warrior in her. She was willing to go anywhere at any time and speak to anybody. She was a mourning mother, and she decided that enough was enough. Let the world see. Thursday night right after Women of the Movement on ABC. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. 
There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. All eyes on a powerful winter storm moving across the country. At least four states have already declared states of emergency. 75 million on alert for heavy snow, treacherous ice, and bitter cold from the Midwest to the Southeast and the Northeast from now through early next week. Ahead of the storm, bone-chilling, freezing weather for much of the East Coast. And the so-called Pharma Bro has been ordered by a New York federal judge to pay $64 million for hiking the price of a life-saving drug from $13.50 to $750 per pill. He was sued by the FTC and several states. The judge also banned him for life from the pharmaceutical industry. Martin Screlly is serving an unrelated seven-year sentence for securities fraud. And Netflix is raising its prices for all of its plans in the U.S. The company's standard price will rise to $15.50 per month. That's a $1.50 price hike. The 4K plan is going to be $20, and the basic plan that comes without HD will now cost $10. The hike goes into effect immediately for new subscribers and will be gradually rolled out for existing users. Now to the pandemic as the Omicron surge pushing cases and hospitalizations to new record highs. The CDC has weighed in on which masks to wear and beginning tomorrow, insurers must reimburse Americans for at-home COVID tests. Also tonight, the fallout from that Supreme Court ruling knocking down President Biden's vaccine mandate for large businesses. And finally, the hopeful signs as we head into this holiday weekend. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, the CDC is out with that long-awaited guidance on masks, warning that loosely woven cloth masks provide the least protection, that N95 and KN95 masks might be a better option, and that these highly protective masks may be important for people in high-risk settings or at risk for severe disease. But the CDC is stopping short of urging all Americans to upgrade their masks, even though health experts have been recommending higher quality masks in the wake of Omicron. The CDC is recognized saying that N95 and KN95 masks really represent the gold standard right now. But at the same time, if those masks aren't available to you, a lower quality mask like a surgical mask or even double masking with a cloth mask still is better than no mask at all. It comes just as the government rolls out a new program tomorrow, reimbursing insured Americans for up to eight at-home COVID tests per month. But insurance companies warn it will take time to set up the new system. Keep that receipt and you'll be in reimbursed um, for that purchase. I just think it's going to be potentially a little bit bumpy here in the next maybe even several weeks. As for those free rapid tests the president has promised to send to American homes, the White House today said each household will be able to order four tests at covidtest.gov starting next Wednesday, and they will take seven to 12 days to ship out. <laughs> 
And today, growing concerns in Chicago, where hundreds of public school students staged a walkout to protest in-person learning and call for more safety measures. Why are they sending, back to, sending right. us back to school? They should make sure everybody take their test, everybody take COVID test. The COVID surge infecting 780,000 Americans every day, more than twice the number rolling up their sleeves for the first vaccine shot. And just 24 hours after the Supreme Court knocked down the president's vaccine mandate covering 80 million workers, tonight General Electric suspending its mandate. I think what businesses need to do is take this on voluntarily. Instead of being compelled by the government, they should mandate these vaccines for their own employees. It's really good for keeping their workplaces safe. Uh, and keeping our country safe. And there are positive signs Omicron is in retreat in the Northeast where it hit hard first. Cases in New York State dropping from 90,000 a week ago to 46,000 today. And hospitalizations are starting to decline too. Turning the corner. You heard it here first. I've been waiting to say that. And Ariel Reshev joins us now. Ariel, tell us about this new study of NBA players that could shed light on how transmissible the virus is. Right, so Steph, this new study of NBA players showed that more than half that contracted the Omicron variant were potentially still infectious after five days. Experts tell us that's why it's so critically important that people follow the CDC guidelines to isolate for five days and then to mask for five more. Stephanie? Very good advice. All right, Ariel, thank you so much. Now to the most serious charges in the January 6th Capitol riot. As 11 members of the right-wing militia group, the Oath Keepers, are facing indictment for seditious conspiracy. Today, the group's leader appeared in court where he stands accused of planning the use of force to block the 2020 election's certification. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Today, Stuart Rhodes, the founder and head of the right-wing militia group, the Oath Keepers, facing a federal judge, and if convicted, potentially decades in prison. He intends to fight these charges till the very, very end. The hearing a day after the FBI searched his home north of Dallas, where Rhodes, a Yale Law School graduate, an Army veteran, was taken into custody. Rhodes and at least 10 other alleged members of the Oath Keepers accused of seditious conspiracy of a premeditated plot to use force to block the certification of Joe Biden's election as president. And according to the FBI, Rhodes allegedly began planning to disrupt the transfer of power soon after the November 2020 election. This is what he said just days after the election. Because we have men already stationed outside D.C. as a nuclear option in case they attempt to remove the president illegally. We will step in and stop it. That planning allegedly included reconnaissance of the nation's capital, buying firearms, ammunition, gun scopes, and other tactical gear. He allegedly bought tens of thousands of dollars of worth of ammunition and weapons in the days before and after January 6th. And plans were allegedly made for teams of heavily armed quick reaction forces to stand by right outside the nation's capital. Prosecutors say these images show Oath Keepers staging weapons in a Virginia hotel. The indictment details a series of chilling encrypted communications, allegedly between Rhodes and his followers. On December 11th, 2020, Rhodes allegedly sent a message in a private group chat stating that if President-elect Biden were to assume the presidency, quote, it will be a bloody and desperate fight. We're going to have a fight. That can't be avoided. And on Christmas Day, Rhodes allegedly wrote of Congress, it will be torches and pitchforks time if they don't do the right thing. Another Rhodes attorney who says his client never went inside the Capitol claims the government's case is built on lies. They went to the Capitol to provide security at a demonstration that turned into chaos. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas for that. The president and vice president are continuing their efforts to gain enough support in the Senate to pass new voter protections. But with conservative Senate Democrats Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin insisting any voting rights bill pass without changes to the filibuster rule, the chances of voting legislation being signed into law are slim. ABC's Ike Ajochi is in Washington with the latest. It's a major blow for protecting the right to vote for millions of Americans. Shortly before President Biden was scheduled to arrive on Capitol Hill to speak to Senate Democrats about changing the filibuster, Kirsten Cinema delivered a speech on the Senate floor repeating her opposition to amending the rule. I will not support separate actions that worsen the underlying disease of division infecting our country. President Biden emerging from the meeting sounding somewhat somber. I hope we can get this done. 
The honest to God answer is, I don't know what they're going to get this done. Democrats say new protections are needed at the ballot box because 19 states have passed laws restricting voting rights in the wake of former President Trump's lies about there being widespread election fraud. This is a defining moral moment. It is uh, the most important thing we can do this Congress. Last night, Biden holding a private meeting at the White House with Senators Sinema and Joe Manchin, another conservative Democrat opposed to changing the filibuster rule. The White House describing this second meeting as a candid and respectful exchange about views on voting rights, but no mention of a deal. For now, the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act are scheduled to be debated Tuesday, but without a change to the filibuster. Democrats don't have the 60 votes needed to end debate and move on to a vote. Still, the administration vowing to continue their fight for voting rights. I will be continuing with extensive meetings and discussions about how we can see this through. Our thanks to Ike. North Korean state media posted new photos from a missile launch they claim happened from a train. They say the launches were to determine actual combat capability of their mobile missile systems. You may recall the North Koreans used a similar portable train launch last September. And turning to an ABC News exclusive, a new twist in the Murdoch murder saga. Before the mother and son of a prominent South Carolina family were gunned down last summer, Paul Murdoch was involved in a fatal boat crash. This morning, the parents of the victim are breaking their silence. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has that story. It seemed like just another night. Six young people, three couples, out on a boat in the South Carolina Low Country. 911, where's your emergency? We're in a boat crash and one is missing. Please send someone. Oh, no, I'm coming. We're calling. We're calling, okay? 19 year old Mallory Beach was thrown from the boat. No one could find her. I just kept praying that they would see her, like, on a sandbar somewhere that. She just couldn't get to us, but she was safe. Seven days later, her body was recovered. The coroner ruling she died from drowning and blunt force trauma. The big question, who was driving that boat? Mallory's boyfriend, Anthony Cook, immediately pointing the finger at 19-year-old Paul Murdoch. My sit girlfriend down, gone, sit, sit Do you think it's funny? Sit down, sit down. Hope he's right. Hell. Paul is the younger son of attorney Alec Murdoch, the Murdoch family, a prominent South Carolina legal dynasty going back generations. Paul was just driving and doing donuts. You said you noticed that Paul was getting kind of drunk? I could tell he was drunk because he like, he gets drunk a lot and it's just kind of like he just is a whole other person when he's drunk. But charges didn't come right away. Evidence was allegedly missing. Questions of how the investigation was handled and why circled around the community. Were you worried that there wasn't going to be a charge for what happened? Yes, I was worried about that. Just being from the family that he's from, it would be probably a cover up. You thought that from the first day? I did. What was the reason for why you guys filed the civil suit? What motivated me was getting evidence of, of everything before it disappeared. Her life meant something. For us, she was our baby. We had to defend her honor. Almost two months after the crash, Paul was indicted on charges of voting under the influence. What was your reaction to hearing that he had been charged finally? I was pleased that finally we were it was starting to move forward. But in June of last year, before his case could go to trial, Paul and his mother Maggie were found brutally murdered. The killings still unsolved and no suspects have been named. We've heard that statement that you finally got justice. This is not justice for us. And he did not deserve it, neither did his mama. Our thanks to Eva. The Murdochs have been adamant that the family in no way interfered in the boat crash investigation, and their lawyers even denied Paul was the driver of the boat that night. You can see Eva's full report on 2020 on ABC and then later on on Hulu.
We turn now to the latest thrilling adventure from a galaxy far, far away. The all-new Book of Boba Fett series from the Star Wars universe finds an actress you may know as the voice of Mulan now taking control of Tatantuni's criminal underworld as the elusive mercenary Fennec Shand alongside bounty hunter Boba Fett. Will Reeves spoke with actress Ming Na Wen about the role she's dreamed about her entire life. Hi. All right, we're gonna dive right in here. Um, how you found yourself at the center of your own Star Wars story even to begin with. And am I to understand you've been dreaming about this for a very long time? Yes, ever since I saw um, the original, you know, the first film now called A New Hope. Before that, it was just Star Wars. Uh, I have really been immersed into this world where the force is actually like my religion after a while. <laughs> like I would pray to God, Buddha and the force. And I still do. It must all feel a bit surreal to achieve a thing that you had dreamed of for so long. Yeah, it's crazy because um, how many people get to say that, right? Even now when I see myself um, on the episodes, you know, the Book of Boba Fett is airing right now, it's streaming, and I'm still sort of astounded. It's like an out-of-body experience. This is like winning lotto for me. The character you portray is Fennec Shand. It's, she's an elite mercenary assassin with a moral ambiguity that you've likened to Han Solo in the past. So in what ways might you lean into that comparison and how might it inform your performance? I think there is this uh, sort of um, maverick quality that they both share. She's sort of a loner, which I think separates them a bit. Right now, she just cares about money and aligning herself with um, the best opportunities. So right now, it's aligning herself with the legendary Boba Fett. Now. Let's talk about the physicality of your role. You've done Street Fighter, you've done Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Mulan. You're no stranger to action and to performing physical roles, doing stunts. How has the past informed the present in that way? When I did Street Fighter, it was so much work back then. We trained like three times a day. Stunt fighting is incredibly hard, but so much fun. And boy, it keeps me in shape. I'm actually kind of lazy when it comes to exercise. What have you been most surprised by your character in the book of Boba Fett? That she came back to life <laughs> in The Mandalorian, you know? And, uh, and that's all I can say at the moment. I mean, the biggest surprise is um, that, uh, you know, she is able to partner up with someone because bounty hunters are very much loners. And I think this is a, a real new experience for her to have to trust someone and have someone trust her. So um, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how their dynamic evolve over the episodes. The Book of Boba Fett, it's also changing pre-existing conceptions of some characters from some previous storylines like in the past, Tusken Raiders were seen as primitive savages, but now they're portrayed as natives of Tatooine, protecting their ancestral grounds. So my question is, what do you think that the change of perception in some of the Star Wars characters and storylines does for the Star Wars universe going forward? Well, I think it challenges um, a lot of the Star Wars fans who, um, are so knowledgeable, you know, that they, they have definite opinions and ideas about uh, the characters and, and their, um, either their demise or their evolution. And this sort of creates a better understanding I think, and a clear picture of people like the Tuscans, because I remember watching Star Wars, like they were, to my mind, you know, were the, the scary guys that you have to run away from or avoid, right? That they were the scavengers where they uh, pirate and steal things and live off of others, basically. And then you find out in the Book of Boba Fett that they're the indigenous people, really, of Tatooine. 
and have had their land stripped. And, you know, and it parallels a lot of history that um, we all read about and know about. And um, I think it's it's wonderful to be able to uh, sort of have a deeper insight into these characters that were more in the peripheral, in, including Boba Fett. You know, he only had like six minutes of airtime between um, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, which um, I think is very exciting for the fans. Is there anything that you can share about the rest of the season of the Book of Boba Fett for diehard Star Wars fans like yourself? Um, well, there are uh, four more episodes to enjoy and watch. <laughs> Uh, when I look back on it, or when I'm even watching an, a new episode of the Book of Boba Fett, um, it's 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 a privilege. It really is, and and I'm very grateful. And I'm I'm hoping that you know I'll have more chances to um, portray these characters in different venues. Our thanks to Will. The Book of Boba Fett is now streaming on Disney+. Plus. It is on my to-do list for this weekend to watch. And still to come, the Ice Queen of TikTok. What's up next? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family, himself, in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right.
We're tracking several headlines around the world. Thousands have gathered for vigils across Ireland to remember a 23-year-old woman who was killed earlier this week while running along a popular canal. The murder reminding many of the death of Sarah Everett, who was killed in England while walking home. Irish police recently released a person of interest in the murder, but pledged to find the killer. More memorials are scheduled in the coming days. And a sad sight in Guatemala, the bodies of 19 of those 56 migrants killed in that horrific truck accident in Mexico last month were returned to their homeland. Five of the deceased were minors. Authorities in Mexico are still working to identify additional migrants who died and provide medical support and protection to survivors of the incident. And tens of thousands of worshipers in northern India gathered for a holy dip in the river Ganges, despite a rise in COVID cases there. The ritual happens during the Ma Mela festival, one of the most sacred in the country. Uh, it's a bath in the river that's believed to wash away sins and free adherence from the cycle of death and rebirth. A similar festival is held in a Himalayan town, uh, was held last year, and it was called a super spreader event by doctors. Now to the Americans on the job hunt. According to a survey by Resume Builder, one in four American workers plans to quit their job this year with hopes of a professional upgrade. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has expert tips on how to land the gig you really want. After four years of working in healthcare, Philadelphia native Sierra Parsley is ready to change her career. Her goal, find a new job in IT. I am looking into project management. However, I have so many transferable skills that I'm looking to go anywhere. But her search hasn't been exactly fruitful. After six months and about 20 job applications, she's only scored one phone interview. Basically overwhelmed. I'm not getting any calls back. So we enlisted the help of LinkedIn career expert Andrew McCaskill, who had the chance to review some of Sierra's most pressing questions. I would love to know if there is anything else that I could do to get my foot in the door. Sierra's doing so many of the right things. She's got a great picture on her LinkedIn profile. She's got her skills highlighted there. One of the things that I think that she should do is look at hashtag open to work that alerts all recruiters that, hey, I'm looking for a new opportunity. Her next question? What's the best way to start networking? One is get a warm introduction from somebody that you already know. Secondly, be specific with the ask when you do make that connection. Busy people need specificity. Third, refresh their memory. Point out something that you've got in common. And finally, how to get that response. Andrew says persistence is key being first to respond, being highly responsive to a recruiter, sending a follow-up note, all of those things still really, really matter. Thanks to Rebecca for that report and good luck Sierra and everybody else searching for a new job in 2022. Let's take a chilly turn to a woman whose claim to fame is being the ice queen of TikTok. ABC's Will Gans spoke to her about her very strong love for snow. That's good luck right there. <laughs> Janet Stewart is the ice queen of TikTok. They've made fun of me for years because I like snow so much. I guess it was inevitable at 40, I become, you know, <laughs> TikTok famous for freezing pants. Frozen pants. Put the pants out front. Hold on. <laughs> frozen <laughs> eggs. Yes. It's this cold. <laughs> and frozen spaghetti. I mean, come on. The neighbors are probably like, looking through the blinds like are you seeing this <laughs> what she, like what is she doing again i mean if you can't have fun and you can't laugh at it like i said i'd i'd just cry and be miserable and my tears would freeze and <laughs> janet is no stranger to the cold born in south dakota moving to michigan's upper peninsula now living in minnesota with her husband and daughters as a kid you love it right and then as you become an adult People get so grumpy about the snow. And I'm like, you know what? No, we just need to spread some joy and some positivity and some love. And I don't know. So I'm glad everyone else is getting a kick out of it. Janet oh, laying on the Uper accent so extra snow. thick for TikTok. Uper, as in UP for Upper Peninsula. We don't scoop snow in the UP. You move snow from point A to point B because it doesn't go anywhere. Move the snow. Make the vowel like longer. So it's Fargo. 
So the big, <laughs> the funny thing that they have people say is the boat show at the Fargo Dome. It's like the boat show at the Fargo Dome, hey? <laughs> TikTok's ice queen warming hearts with some good old fashioned laughter. Why you got to be so cold? Will Gans, ABC News, New York. <laughs> She's having some fun in the snow. I'm sure her kids love it and there's so many other people on TikTok love it as well. Thanks for making us laugh. That is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. World News Now and America This Morning. The best.